Hello, uh, my name is Rachel Minot and I am currently the Assistant Curator for Contemporary Collecting here at London Transport Museum. Um, so for my presentation, I'm just going to speak about kind of the current practices and what's been done here regarding contemporary collecting. So as we've heard today from um, our lovely speakers, uh, contemporary collecting isn't, isn't a new thing. It's got a long and varied history um, and it can be approached in many different ways. Uh, so here at LTM, we're just trying to create an innovative and sustainable uh, procedures uh, for collecting contemporary narratives. So I'm just going to start a bit with the uh, kind of a brief introduction to the project. This is a three-year uh, Arts Council England resilience funded project following AIMS. They address resilience in all its kind of different forms and uh, meanings. Um, and these are the focuses for the curators. So um, we're hoping to be better able at collecting and reflecting London today for future generations. And we hope to improve and embed and share excellent practice within the sector, which is what we're doing here today with you lovely people. If we move on to kind of how we plan to do this, uh, again, I'm going to focus in a bit on a, a particular project. So uh, one of the main focuses of this um, of our uh, pro our uh, project has been this uh, innovative con con um, curatorial correspondence project. Um, this is how we're aiming to start the process. Um, it'll engage with a number of different employees working across uh, TFL. Um, and these will be decision makers, people who are kind of working at the foreground um, for the transformative activities that are going to affect the way that public trans uh, transport is developing. Um, and this project will hopefully revolutionize the way uh, we collect these tangible and intangible <coughs> projects, um, objects, and uh, the content will be created by the correspondence. So it'll be, indi it'll be dictated by individuals. Um, and so it'll be inherently personal, which is quite lovely. But it'll also address within its form and its content, uh, this uh, the, the rapidly changing and developing digital technology um, that we're kind of working with today. Um, and though we won't exclusively collect through the correspondence, it'll give us a really great insight into what we should be collecting and ensuring that we as a museum are, are telling the story of how London transport is evolving today. So this is how I envision the correspondence. <laughs> It's a, it's a really new, uh, quite inspiring project to take part in, mostly because it's an experiment. It's quite exciting. The outcomes haven't really been formulated yet. So when we're sitting there envisioning this collection, the outcome is, an, is an, as infinite as the imagination, the technical abilities, and the uh, technological advancements that are available to us. And we've been really lucky to be uh, surrounded in large supply with all of these things. So. We're working with a, uh, a group of people who have really huge imaginations and really great technical skills. Um, and we're actually being shown this kind of technical advancements that are awe-inspiring. Um, however, with great potential comes great responsibility. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to kind of go into a bit of detail about the questions and obstacles that we've been faced at the beginning of the project. So the number one reality that we've had to come to face to, uh, come to face is that we're not working alone. The project isn't within a vacuum um, and we are within an institution that has its existing con uh, procedures for contemporary collecting, as well as being only one of a number of projects that are already being undertaken by the museum. Um, but it does mean that uh, we have a lot of very real practicalities that we have to face, such as creating the work and coordinating conversations between these multiple participants has been quite administratively difficult and it requires a lot of preparation stakeholder management, networking, investments, because um, we're creating kind of a multiple party buy-in of investors, sorry, just, um, <laughs> who are contributing to the preservation of uh, history that they're helping to make. Um, and as with all stakeholders, we have to make sure that our correspondents are really happy, which means that the project has to be really easy, rewarding, and safe. So these are the happy stakeholders. So one of the priorities is that we have to make the project complement rather co than contradict um, our correspondence everyday life. Mm -hmm. um, the thought being that if it comes naturally, it can be sustainable and so we can ensure lo longevity. The result has been that we've had to create bespoke briefs for each project um, with the medium of the content being dictated by the individual's roles and tastes and experience, which has led to a variety of approaches being taken thus far, including short blogs, video diaries, images and collection of documents, 
creating a fa fairly wide range of content, um, some of which is simply just modernized versions of, uh, and often digitized versions of objects that exist in our collection, in, um, such as new tickets or kind of oyster cards and contactless, um, new kind of minutes um, and meetings, is just, they're just digital now and paperless, uh, new maps are kind of apps. So um, that's quite interesting to see that, that mapping. <coughs> but often uh, we've got, one of the other focuses is that we're having personal reflections and, um, of experiences and examples of experimental technology that are being showcased potentially at international levels. Um, so we don't really have necessarily a mirror for those in our historic collection. Um, at the beginning of each project, we're asking each correspondent to provide an introduction of some sort, detailing who they are, what they do, what the project is, their role, just to kind of provide context um, for the collection in the future. Um, at all times, we have to keep thinking, like, how, would, how is this information going to be used? Um, what do we kind of want, really? And we have to make sure that it is usable. So our curatorial correspondents, uh, they will generate the content uh, that will capture the series, the stories that they're helping to make as they unfold, and before kind of hindsight kicks in and edits their memories. But this this raises a lot of fears within the um, within the correspondence regarding the impact of kind of recording potential mistakes. It's been risen a lot. It's one of the things we try and edit out when we give these glossy presentations at the end. That along the way to success, it's just a lot of failure. Um, and uh, our correspondents are sometimes quite fearful of what that would be, what the repercussions of recording those failures would be, kind of on their perceptions of their businesses or personal and professional relationships at the time. And so in some cases, we've actually had to, to seek secondary approval um, from senior management after we've explained the project in uh, more detail. So the, the wording we're kind of using um, within our licensing um, is in line with the Copyright Designs and Patent Act of 1988 which would give um, the creators, um, which names the, co um, the uh, correspondents as creators of literary, dramatic, musical, artistic works, and they have the right to control the way their material is being used. It's importantly, they can always choose to stop and pause or, or erase the recording or any part of it during the process. Um, and we as an institution are agreeing to store um, the recordings, but also are permitted to distribute them to the public in any and all media. So this allows kind of both parties uh, to gain as much as possible from the situation. Uh, the museum is generally free to use the work displayed um, in publications and exhibitions, while the donors can uh, place a variety of restrictions as they so desire and feel quite safe in sharing their information. So in some instances, our correspondents have actually asked us to moderate the content to ensure that uh, they're speaking about their projects and not using it as an exercise through which to unload personal issues. And we're always thinking about the future use of the content. So it's really important for us as well. But there's a really big part of me that really loves like reality TV and celebrity magazines that kind of really wants it to be just juicy office scandals and secrets. And I'm hoping potentially there's a little space for a taste of that. Um, but obviously the content needs to fit into our collecting remit and there's a certain level of moderation that is absolutely necessary. So using the content, um, how do we imagine we're going to use this? Um, in some cases, the content um, that we're provided, the value is pretty easy to spot. A good quality image is always a good quality image. They always have display potential, particularly ones uh, like the one above, uh, which has its own kind of contextualizing information. Um, so it can really survive on its own and articulate kind of an event without much intervention. Um, but from the same kind of correspondent, we received the image below which I suppose if you know what it is, you know what it is and you'll understand it. But um, I'm guessing the average Joe or Jane uh, will just look at it and think it's a strange empty bus. Um, but it's in fact, it's a prototype of a driverless bus that's being trialed in La Rochelle. So in a few years time, if we do have driverless buses in London, we'll know why we don't have this one. <laughs> <laughs> because this particular model couldn't uh, differentiate between a puddle obstructing its way um, or a person. Um, so it wasn't really um, fit for London. So far it's been really fantastic to be a part of this project because people seem to be inspired by it and motivated to take part in it. Um, they are involved in kind of creating these pilots um, for a variety of collecting methods which have implications way above and beyond this project at this museum. The project really addresses the idea of curating your own history um, and creating material that tells a narrative that you're helping to, to make. Um, the implications of 
of uh, making known hidden histories is something that I'm particularly really excited by. Um, and it kind of liberates the idea of collecting ephemera from the limitations of kind of production value and dissemination and reach and money. Um, and it kind of prioritizes digital work in a way that I think really privileges young voices, um, which is quite refreshing to me. And uh, it kind of really mirrors the society that we're living in today. Uh, so we've really tried to brush on this by uh, addressing the LGBTQ narrative, which is so far quite underrepresented in the museum. So last year we collected through the museum's established policies um, and procedures the first ever rainbow crossing in London. However, within this kind of new lens of contemporary collecting and the focus on digital media the, and self-authored narratives, we're now also examining blogs created by contemporary figures relating to this narrative. So for example, Martin Lukes, the business development manager and chair of Outbound, which is TFL's uh, LGBTQ network, um, who led the project to have the Rainbow Crossing developed and displayed on the streets of London for Pride in 2014, um, authors his own WordPress blog, WordPress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and through this medium, he kind of discusses the work he does through Outbound. And uh, in one post, he kind of describes the difficulties faced in getting the Rainbow Crossing approved and installed. Similarly, Ian Beetlestone's word, Words on the Street blog illustrates the personal experiences of a taxi driver trying to promote gay rights by driving a taxi draped in a rainbow livery through London. Both of these personal reflections kind of illustrate why these objects are forms of celebration and resistance. So again, in the future, when we eventually achieve full equality, and we can look back and say, oh, can you believe how people didn't just accept and love one another? Uh, what a wonderful world we live in now that these battles have been fought and won. It'll be, they'll be like celebrating TFL for the work they've done and uh, the kind of retention we have of that information. But the truth is, once you kind of get involved in the world of collecting blogs, there is like an amazing amount of potential in there. Um, and uh, it was, I was at an event recently where we were kind of discussing the fact that social media was uh, our new ephemera. Um, but ephemera with this strange concept of permanence, uh, where everyone is able to collect an already organized trail of tickets, photographs, newsletters, articles, um, with minimal effort and absolutely no training. And the wonderful world of social media is this fantastic frontier uh, within which we can work. And it has been a large focus of this project so far, because nothing quite addresses the questions around mass produced ephemera in the modern world like Twitter. Uh, Twitter is so important to our modern lives that it's quoted regularly in our newspapers, um, national news, um, and there's kind of no need for interviews or questionnaires anymore. You can just simply crawl through Twitter and see what the public, how the public responded. And it's universally seen kind of as this way to keep your pulse on <coughs> global reaction to events. We've kind of been testing different ways to review tweets, um, to collecting tweets, sorry. So currently we are using Google Docs to harvest the tweets and are experimenting with how to kind of make them an accessible objects. Analytics are obviously uh, one tool one could use um, in the industry to explore, um, and we could, we'll go with through this further along in the project. However, the main thing we want to address is how we can uh, monitor mood and the change of mood over a period of time. So for example, with the DLR strikes, the tone was quite humorous at the start of the strikes, um, with Innocent Smoothies writing a tweet about robot uprisings, which got a lot of retweets. And you can see its popularity in the word doodle. Um, however, by the end of the day, having experienced the strikes, the mood significantly changed. And so we're kind of really looking into the future of how we capture the shift, figuring out what elements of this will be an object, um, how to define it, where it starts, where it ends, how it fits into the remit, and where the boundaries will lie between collection of material, um, collection material and material for library and research. Other elements we'll have to consider are images and tweets, uh, so with Twitter determined use, texts and tweets are open to third party use, uh, which allows a lot of retweets, et cetera. Um, and as long as the Twitter handle is quoted, there are very few restrictions put on um, elements of tweets, um, the text element of tweets. However, uh, images are completely different. You can, uh, you can collect links um, to images on Twitter, but um, you can't actually collect images of Twitter. Um, which kind of creates a problem when you're trying to collect an authentic reaction from Twitter, as images give context that most tweets require to be understood. And it's normally an exam amazing example of kind of 
creativity of individual users, their personalities, their sense of humor. Um, the other issue with digital material, um, as <laughs> tried to move that one away quickly, um, is kind of digital space and how we kind of allocate that. Um, so when we're acquiring an object, whether it's a physical object or a digital one, we're agreeing to, um, to keep it in perpetuity. So again, we're kind of fortunate enough to not be working within a vacuum, and the current Born, Born Digital project, ongoing within the museum, kind of provides the support we need to navigate some of these complex issues um, around digital space. Um, so it seems like this kind of intangible thing, digital space, but it's quite simple enough to calculate. And the total storage costs are really possible to kind of determine, which is a lot more difficult for um, physical objects where you don't normally calculate the percentage cost for the renting of that spot in the building and the energy bills, et cetera, that each object requires. Um, so there are more complicated issues besides space that we have to think about, such as wh what format do we save these digital items in and what kind of commitment do we make to make the original files readable in their original formats? Um, and when software updates um, kind of eventually make everything unreadable, this ideological conservation discussion about um, that's really mirrored in, in kind of debates about physical conservation. But again, the project's really new, um, so we haven't really drawn any conclusions, but we're likely to treat this as an ad hoc kind of decision. Um, with some files, the original format's going to be really intrinsic to how we understand it, um, but with others, uh, such as like a Word document of a minutes in a meeting, um, the priority will be in the content versus the form. So I'm going to end here on questions um, of the future. So these are all questions that have been raised. Um, we haven't really found an answer to yet. So is the project sustainable outside of ACE? Who will see the digital collection? Do we really want to collect only new projects to get a complete picture? How should we collect, uh, commit to collecting a year? How much should we commit to collecting a year? Uh, should we collect on social media, all social media formats? Um, what are the wider industry implications? Um, and can this support a self-authored histories and address kind of institutional misrepresentation. And we will explore these questions going forward, but it's, it's just kind of, kind of food for thought. Um, however, I did choose uh, this image at the back for a particular reason. Uh, it's from the museum's collection, and it, it's uh, an imagining of 100 years in the future, done in 1926. So the projective image is of 2026, so that's 10 years from now. So in 10 years, our museum might be really different, it could be a series of holograms curated by robots with text generated by social media and people being brought around by driverless cars. Or potentially, it could be really similar to how it is now, but with a bit more high-tech gadgets, uh, maybe a more interactive equipment, and we might need to kind of think of data storage facilities alongside our museum stores. But the point is, it's, uh, it's, we're kind of at the point alongside our curatorial correspondence where we're helping to support this future that we're making and we don't necessarily know what's going to happen, but it's a really exciting part of contemporary collecting. Oops.